I'd like to welcome you to the 52nd annual SUNY Buffalo Law School Distinguished Alumni Awards Dinner. My name is Terry Gilbride. I'm the president of the Law Alumni Association. And before we get started with our formal program, we have a special treat tonight. Uh, one of our honorees this evening, Bill Savino, uh, is going to uh, start our program with a short musical performance. And Bill, uh, Bill's on the bass over there, and he's uh, being accompanied by uh, fellow SUNY Buffalo Law alumni Ken Africano on keyboards and Lucy Dodd on, uh, on vocals. Now, Lucy, you might recognize, she's the assistant director of development at the law school. Uh, so after she sings, she's going to hit you up for a donation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Bill Savino, Ken Africano, and Lucy Dodd as they perform a piece entitled Love Being Here With You. At this time, I would like to introduce our distinguished guests seated here with me on the dais, starting with tonight's honoree. To my right, the Honorable Eugene M. Fahey, class of 1984. Uh, Judge Fahey is a recipient of the Judiciary Award in a New York State Supreme Court Appellate Division, 4th Department Justice. To my left, we have the Honorable Lisa Block Rodwin, class of 1985. And Judge Rodwin is the recipient of the Community Service Award and an Erie County Family Court Judge. To my left, we have the Honorable Robert T. Russell, Jr., who is the recipient of the award given to a non alumnus <laughs> Judge Russell is a Buffalo City Court Judge and an acting judge for Erie County Court. 
Um, straight from the stage to his seat, our musical prodigy, Mr. Savino, Bill Savino, class of 1975. Bill is recipient of the Business Award. He is a partner at Damon and Morey and a former president of the Law Alumni Association. Uh, to my right, Robert C. Schwenkel, class of 1982. Bob is the recipient of the Private Practice Award and he is a partner at the New York City Law Firm of Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson. Um, and uh, rounding out our honorees, another representative of the class of 1982, they did pretty well this year. We have Michael J. Sergala, Jr. Uh, Michael is to my right. Michael is a recipient of the Public Service Award and Trial Attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Criminal Division, Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section in Washington. Now from our law school, uh, we have to my right, our Dean and SUNY Distinguished Professor, Mikhail Matua, Dean Matua. And to my left, I, didn't even, I, I, I lost track of you, Eileen. Eileen Fleshman, Vice Dean of the Law School and the Executive Director of our Alumni Association. And from our Alumni Association, to my left I have the Honorable Lenora Foote Beavers, class of 1997, who is president-elect of the Law Alumni Association and Erie County Family Court Support Magistrate. <laughs> also to my left, we have Brian Gwitt, class of 1998. Brian is a vice president of the Law Alumni Association. He is a partner at Damon and Morey, and he is going to be a co-presenter of tonight's awards. Finally, uh, we have Ann Joint, class of 2005. Ann is a member of the annual dinner committee. She is a partner at Lipsitz and Pontiero. And Ann is also a co-presenter of tonight's awards. So, welcome to all of our distinguished guests. Now when you're president of the Law Alumni Association, one of the things, probably the first things that you figure out is that you always need to listen to Eileen. And uh, she, uh, <laughs> you, if, you, if you ignore her, you do so at your peril. Uh, <laughs> and tonight, uh, you'll be pleased to know that I was instructed uh, by Eileen to be warm, funny, and brief. <laughs> I don't know about the warm and funny part, those aren't my strong suits, but I promise you my remarks will be brief. I want to first thank everyone for coming tonight to pay tribute to our distinguished honorees. Tonight we honor several of our fellow alumni who through their impressive accomplishments have brought great honor to themselves and distinction to our law school. And I also, uh, we honor our, our colleague, Judge Russell, who serves as a shining example of what creativity and compassion can, can be accomplished in this profession. In addition to our honorees, I want to thank those of you that are members of the Law Alumni Association. This past year, we've had the opportunity to participate in a comprehensive university-wide dialogue about alumni engagement. And I'm pleased to report to you that your law school enjoys a level of alumni participation that is the envy of all of the other alumni associations in the university. That support, whether it's through alumni association membership or through volunteering your time is more necessary now than ever. I don't need to tell you that this is an exceptionally challenging time for law schools and legal education. What we do at the Law Alumni Association has a direct impact on the quality of the education at our law school through th things such as the Alumni Association scholarships and first year student mentoring. We're fortunate in these difficult times to have strong and capable leadership in the form of our Dean, Mikhail Matua. At this point, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dean Matua, who will offer some comments. Uh, thank you, Terry, and um, well, um, I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's festivities and event. Um, you know, when the people were singing over there, 
I was not aware that Lucy could sing that well. And so I was wondering why she's working in the development office in the law school instead of singing and making money so that I can ask her to make donations to the law school. Um, uh, Terry, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Terry for his stewardship of the Law Alumni Association. You've done a wonderful job these last uh, uh, two years. You've been wonderful. I've been a partner to me as Dean and to the law school. So I very much appreciate that, and I would like us to give Terry a round of applause. Um, I'd like to recognize all the awardees tonight. Uh, all of them are distinguished and deserving of the honors that they will receive tonight. In fact, I would say that the honors are long overdue. Uh, so congratulations uh, to all of you. Um, I'd like to report a bit of good news. You've all heard about the drop in applications to law schools that the last five years law school applications have gone from a high of 100,000 for the 200 law schools in the country to under 50,000 today. So more than one half. That's uh, you know, a precipitous drop in applications for any industry. And um, at UB Law, uh, we have not been immune to, to these drops, uh, except that this year, for the first time, our applications are flat from last year. So this year, they were not dropped in, our, in applications at all. Um, and this is in contrast to other law schools in the state, where we've seen drops of anywhere from 10 uh, to 30 percent. So that's a bit of good news for us to celebrate uh, uh, tonight. Um, but tonight is a night to recognize our awardees and to recognize all of you, our supporters, um, and our alumni and friends uh, who make our law school uh, great. I have said before to all of you that, um, that there is no law school in America that can hope to be great, that can aspire to greatness without the support of its alumni. It does not exist. If you look at all the great law schools in the country, uh, from Virginia to Michigan to Harvard, to you name it, the alumni stand behind those law schools. I want to recognize all of you tonight, uh, who are here tonight, because you have been there with us. In fact, the rate of your participation as the alumni to our law school, in terms of giving back to us, is one of the highest in the country. Um, it's a fact. And I attribute this affection, you know, if you want to call it that, to the kind of law school that you attended when you were student. You are giving back is a reflection of the kind of law school that you attended. Um, five years ago, I launched a campaign for Sri Buffalo Law School, a $30 million campaign. And when we did it, I think people thought that it was a very lofty goal because the previous campaign was for $12 million and lasted seven years. We have now a campaign for 30 million that's going to last us seven years. We have 
a little over two years left in the campaign. And tonight, I want to tell you that we have raised, you have raised, $23 million. And that amount is more than 75% of the total of the $30 million. So we have slightly under 25% to go, which is about $7 million. We have two and a half years to do it. And so tonight, as I thank you for the support that you've given us, as I express my utmost gratitude for the sacrifices that you have made to raise the $23 million, I must implore you once again to dig deep into your pockets and get us over the finish line. We cannot afford not to meet our goal. We have two and a half years, seven million dollars to go. I know we can do it. And I know that, I know this because every person that I've ever talked to who went to this law school, and our friends who did not even go to a law school who live in Buffalo and who love this law school, feel and think that we are on the move. And so, I want to urge you, I want to implore you, in fact, I want to beg you to uh, come along with us to complete the campaign. So once again, thank you so much. Let's have a good time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean, for your insights and for your leadership. Besides recognizing the accomplishments of our distinguished honorees, tonight marks the, I guess, the beginning of the official passing of the torch of the presidency of the Law Alumni Association. And I mean this in all sincerity. It's been a tremendous honor to, to be the president of your alumni association this past year. SUNY Buffalo Law School is very, very important to me. It, it made a huge difference in my life, and I can't you know, do enough to, to thank the school for all the wonderful things that it's, that it's bestowed on me. But one of the things that you get when you serve on the Alumni Association board, besides helping your law school, is you get the ability to work with lawyers that you don't regularly interact with. I, I don't practice in family court, so I, I never really get to work with Lenora professionally, except through the Law Alumni Association. And that's multiple times over with many people in different specialties. And you develop special friendships and you develop relationships with, with the fantastic people that, that went to our law school. And my successor, Lenora Foot Beavers, is one of those special people. I've had the opportunity to get to know her the past few years, and I'm really excited about Lenora taking over leadership of your alumni association. She brings with her a strong work ethic and a tremendous commitment to the mission of our law school. And we're, more, we're most fortunate to have her as our leader for the upcoming year. So please join me in welcoming Lenora Foot Beavers, President elect of the SUNY Buffalo Law Alumni Association. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. The Law Alumni Association gratefully acknowledges the generosity of the following underwriters who help make this dinner possible. Proceeds will benefit the activities of the Law Alumni Association. Please hold your applause until all the sponsors and donors have been announced. At the gold level, CTG, m and Bank, Paramount Settlement Planning and Precision Resolution, at the silver level, Lipsitz Green, Chimay, and Cambria, and National Fuel. At the bronze level, the Bar Association of Erie County, Freed, Maxic, CPAs, Jacob Fleischman, and Mugel. We'd also like to thank the following donors. 
Amagon Sanchez and Matry, Batavia Legal Printing, Bouvier Partnership, Brisbane Consulting Group, Salino and Barnes, Chase Investigations International, Chicago Title Insurance, Gar Associates, Goldberg Sagala, Jack W. Hunt and Associates, The Law Office of Lindy Corn, Lexix Nexus, Logan Valenti, Bookbinder and Weintraub, The Minority Bar Association of Western New York, Nesper, Ferber and DiGiacomo, Peter and Vito and Associates, Quantum Color Corporation, Sawyers and Sacco, Schnitter, Sicarelli, Mills, PLLC, UB Alumni Association Incorporated, the Western New York Chapter of the Women's Bar Association of the State of New York, Wilder and Linneball, and the Zanger Group. We also thank our two media sponsors, The Daily Record and Business First Buffalo Law Journal. Please join me in giving applause for all of those sponsors. We'd also like to thank this year's dinner co-chairs. Neither co-chair could join us today. Uh, Scott Becker, class of 93, and Jeff Reina, class of 99. If we could give them a round of applause. <laughs> they also could not do the work without their dinner committee. And if Joe Hanna is here, and Joint, and Ryan Mills, if you could please stand and be acknowledged for all your hard work in putting together tonight's event. Terry said, you don't, you know, go through these thank yous and not talk about Eileen. <laughs> so we definitely want to thank our executive director, Eileen Fleischman, and her wonderful staff at the alumni office. Um, the assistant director, Lisa Mueller, class of 93. Lisa's around somewhere. <laughs> the assistant gold group director, Pat Warrington. The assistant uh, administrative assistant, Amy Hipnarowski. And alumni database manager, Cynthia Watts. Um, we'd also like to thank Christina Lively, who's the law school's webmaster. Is she here tonight? Amy Atkinson, the law school's director of events. And Laura Connell, the law school's event coordinator, for also helping out this evening. Now I'd like all of our officers and directors to please stand for the Law Alumni Association and be recognized for all your hard work this year and all of your contributions to the law school. Thank you. Celebrating their 60th anniversary, and the 
golden anniversary of the class of 1964 celebrating their 50th anniversary. If you're here tonight from either of those classes, could you please stand? for their long service to the profession, and we thank you for all of your work and dedication to the law school. We're now going to take a break for dinner, and we will return during dessert. Now that we've fed you, before we can uh, get into the rest of the awards presentation, I, uh, I, I have to deliver the shameless plug for our alumni association, so uh, bear with me here. I mentioned earlier that we've been involved in a dialogue with the university, uh, the larger university, all the alumni associations, dental, medical, engineering, business, uh, about alumni engagement. And one of the most important metrics in the dialogue is membership in the alumni association. You, you've probably noticed a bunch of people running around here tonight with stars on their name tags. Um, those are people who are members of the Alumni Association and who have paid their dues for the upcoming year. So if you haven't paid your dues or you aren't a member, please, please do so. Please consider becoming a member if you're not. It, it is the easiest and fastest way to do something positive for your law school. It makes a big, big difference. Um, the, I, uh, at this point in the in the, the program, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Lenora Foot Beavers, who is going to uh, take us into the awards presentation with our honorees. I'm told that our PowerPoint is now working. Is that correct? Okay. So we're good, Laura. Please. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. This is our 52nd awards dinner, and established by the Law Alumni Association Board of Directors in 1963. The Distinguished Alumni Awards recognize the valuable contributions that law school alumni have made to their profession and community. The accept acceptance remarks of the honorees are written in the program booklet along with highlights of their professional careers. Stories from our law school's history have become part of a treasure trove of information that has been compiled in an extensive oral history project initiated in 2000. The project has recorded alumni, faculty members, and others with close ties to the law school, preserving their voices for posterity and electronically indexing their words to provide an easy access for historians, researchers, and others. All six of our honorees have been interviewed as part of the project, and tonight we will feature a clip from each of their interviews as part of the awards presentation. And now, Brian Witt and Ann Joint will co-present tonight's Distinguished Alumni Awards. The first award we're presenting tonight is the, to the Honorable Eugene M. Fahey, Class of 84. Uh, it is my honor this evening to present the award for the judiciary to the Honorable Eugene M. Fahey. When interviewed for the Oral History Project, Justice Fahey was asked what he thought of judicial elections. I think there's a great virtue in all of us having to go out and ask people to help us, and uh, uh, to ask the voters, to ask the lawyers, to ask everyone to help us. Um, uh, particularly judges who are in office having to go out and, and say, please help me. Um, I think um, it's a great cure for judgeitis, you know, and, and judgeitis, you know, where you think that all your jokes are funny, that, <laughs> that you know, that everything you say is brilliant, and no one's going to tell you that, that they're not, and uh, um, so, Having to go out and, uh, um, and get in the rough and tumble of it all is good for you. Now, once elected, a judge's life has its downsides. All those briefs to read, all those oral arguments to hear, and those long black robes you have to wear. But for Justice Fahey, who we honor tonight for his distinguished service to the judiciary, every once in a while there's a little diversion. That diversion came with a flourish in 2007, when Justice Fahey was invited to a lavish estate in Westport, Connecticut, to officiate at the wedding of movie mogul Harvey Weinstein, his honor's longtime friend, and fashion designer Georgina Chapman, founder of Marquesa. Talk about pressure. Among the 300 guests were Cameron Diaz, Renee Zellweger, J-Lo, 
Quentin Tarantino and Rupert Murdoch. Robert De Niro toasted the newlyweds at the reception. Okay, not a typical day. <laughs> but for over seven years as an appellate judge, following nearly a decade in Supreme Court, Justice Fahey has proven anything but typical. He brings that Buffalo-born work ethic and an unassuming thoughtfulness to the job, as well as the kind of patience that comes with years of navigating the minefield of Buffalo's Common Council. Use your bean, vote for Gene, if anyone remembers that slogan. <laughs> and voters were indeed smart enough to send him first to city court and then to Supreme Court. Governor George Pataki also used his bean in cross-party lines to appoint Justice Fahey to the Appellate Division in 2006. A Justice Fahey was serving on the Common Council, in fact, he was in the middle of waging a re-election campaign, when he was in law school. He sat next to the Honorable Aaron Peridotto in the front row of federal civil procedure class. They now sit together on the same appellate bench. He really cares about doing justice. There's no question about that, just as Peridotto says about her colleague. I always know that the work that comes out of his chambers and the work that he does on a case will be thoughtful and thorough. Even if we don't agree, his position is not one that he's taken just by fancy. It's a position that he's arrived at because he's done the work. It's a hot bench when lawyers come to argue, as I know, and Justice Fahey doesn't hesitate to ask the hard questions during oral arguments, as I also know. And Justice Peridotto says that especially in the close calls, where the decision is to uphold or strike down that could go either way, Justice Fahey's analysis carries great weight. He'll talk about the possible impact on the parties and how it might affect the jurisprudence in the court and in the state, she says. He's not a mechanic when he works. He's a very thoughtful judge. Like his fellow honoree tonight, Bill Savino, Justice Fahey is also a talented musician who has played with both a jazz ensemble and a rock group, the band Large Marvin. And if you listen outside the door of his chambers late in the afternoon, sometimes you hear a little bit of rock guitar. It's just the justice blowing off steam. Now, I have a letter in my hands from the Honorable Henry Scudder, who couldn't be here tonight, but he liked this read. Unfortunately, I, un I am unable to attend the SUNY Buffalo Law Alumni Association's annual dinner tonight. I wish to congratulate all of the recipients of the 2014 Distinguished Alumni Awards for their many accomplishments. As, as presiding justice of the Appellate Division, Fourth Department, I'm very familiar with the excellence of graduates of the University of Buffalo Law School. Five of the 11 justices of the Fourth Department and many of the talented attorneys who regularly practice before the court are UB graduates. By the way, I'm off script, but that's great news. <laughs> The Law Alumni Association is giving an award tonight that is of special interest to me. That award is the Distinguished Alumni Award for the Judiciary being presented to the Appellate Division Justice Eugene M. Fahey. I was not surprised to learn that Justice Fahey was receiving this prestigious award. Justice Fahey was appointed to the Appellate Division in 2006 after a distinguished career in Buffalo City Court and State Supreme Court. In 2009, he became a member of the Appellate Division's Constitutional Court. Justice Fahey is an outstanding member of the Appellate Division, Fourth Department, widely respected for his intellect, integrity, work ethic, and temperament. We have all benefited from his expertise and insights. His excellence is recognized statewide as evidenced by his recent inclusion among seven nominees recommended to Governor Cuomo to fill a vacancy on the Court of Appeals. Justice Fahey would be a superb pick by Governor Cuomo for a seat on our state's highest court. Selfishly, however, his departure would be a great loss for the Fourth Department. Jean, I, along with other members of our court, congratulate you on receiving this prestigious award. No one is more deserving. You make us and the University of Buffalo very proud. For his conscientious and diligent performance in the judiciary, I am pleased to present the Distinguished Alumni Award to Honorable Eugene M. Fahey.
Our second award this evening is being given to Robert C. Schwenkel, class of 1982. Bob Schwenkel is this year's recipient of the Award for Private Practice. During his oral history interview, Bob talked about doing his part to help SUNY Buffalo Law graduates. Well, I do. I interview UB Law students every year. I also do a, a, a pre-interview program to help them anticipate, just not just for us, but for other what other firms will will ask UB students. I do believe, as a graduate, <clears throat> I we have a responsibility to make sure that Buffalo students have the opportunities that I was given. Right. And so I try to do that. Lawyers tend to move around a lot. Not Bob, though. All these years later, he's still in the same Manhattan building where he settled in following his graduation from Buffalo Law in 1982. But boy, has he gone far. As chairman of the Global Corporate Practice Group for Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson, Bob, whom we honor tonight for his performance in private practice, manages deal after deal with price tags in the billions of dollars. He co-chairs Freed Frank's corporate department and is global head of its M&A and private equity practice groups. And so, for example, when the European <laughs> private equity firm from Premira decided it wanted to buy Ancestry.com, it came to Bob to help make that happen. When Goldman Sachs and his investment partners bought Dar Dollar General Corporation, they sought out Bob's counsel on the deal. When GS Capital Partners wanted to buy Michael Foods, the big food processing and distribution company, Bob provided the legal and deal-making expertise to make it happen. The list goes on and on, but you get the idea. He's one of the most accomplished graduates ever to come through the New York City market, says his friend and classmate Jeff Crandall, who now practices with Davis, Polk, and Wardell. It's just so hard to have accomplished what he has. 99% of the graduates from any law school are not going to accomplish that. Back when they worked together in the Buffalo Law Review, Bob was the articles editor. Jeff Crandall says, I always knew he was a really, really smart person. But translating that into career success is something else. You certainly have to know the law, and you have to be willing to work extremely hard. You also have to be able to work with the most demanding clients. M&A and private equity deals are tough. Often they get done on a tight time frame, there are a lot of moving pieces, and the clients can be demanding. Sometimes the work is as much about managing nervous investors as it is about providing legal advice. It also helps not to take yourself too seriously. Despite his impressive accomplishments, the roster of blue chip corporate clients, he is the same person I knew in law school, Crandall says. That's pretty remarkable. Most people who accomplish what Bob has have an air about them that they didn't have when they were younger. But he has the same outlook on life he always had. He has a great sense of humor and is completely intact. Bob has also been generous with his time in helping the next generation of would-be New York City lawyers. He has lectured in the law school's New York City program in finance and law since its inception in 2006, sharing the hard-won lessons of his craft and helping our students to get a toehold in the New York market. He also speaks often on private equity and deal-making trends at industry conferences and continuing education programs, and teaches a course on private equity fund formation and transactional issues at Hofstra University School of Law. We, are, we at SUNY Buffalo Law School recognize a star when we see one. And so, for his great success and integrity and a long and distinguished career, we are proud to recognize Robert C. Schwenkel for his leadership by example as a private practitioner with the Distinguished Alumni Award. For community service is presented this evening to family court judge Lisa Block Rodman. In her oral history, she explains how the skills she acquired while in law school enabled her to create positive change in the legal system. You know, I would say that I, I feel that I've used what I learned at the law school to be a success. I feel like I've been successful because I've helped use my skills that I learned in the law school to change 
the legal system here. And I really believe that we have changed. I think that at least in the little area that I work with, um, family violence victims are treated very differently. Uh, sexual assault and child abuse victims are treated very differently. Um, ju the judicial system uh, sees these kind of cases in a whole different light than when I was in law school. And I certainly learned um, to think on my feet, to express myself, and use the law to accomplish change. And I think that's a gift. Now, anyone who's run for political office knows that in a campaign, there's a prop called a palm card, a little full-color card with a family picture of the candidate and some enthusiastic words about why she should get your vote. When Lisa Block Rodwin was gathering petition signatures to get on the ballot for family court judge, her sons had a supply of these cards. Mike Flaherty, an Erie County prosecutor who worked on her campaign committee, says it went like this. The boy said, look, here's me, here's my mom, now sign this. <laughs> it was very effective, Flaherty said. She got the signatures, she won the election and began the next chapter in a career that has made a huge difference in the lives of families and children in this county. It's in recognition of that crusading spirit that we honor Judge Rodman tonight with the award for community service. In 1995, in the aftermath of the O.J. Simpson case, Judge Rodman founded the District Attorney's Domestic Violence Bureau. As its chief, she oversaw the investigation and resolution of 4,000 cases a year that's about 80 cases a week, every week. And looked individually at every single case to determine what kind of plea offer was appropriate. Oprah Winfrey and Diane Sawyer put her on TV as an expert in marital rape, child abuse, and child witnesses in court. But it was in the hard work of not only prosecuting these cases, but raising public awareness of family violence that she made the biggest difference. She was a visionary, and enthusiastic, and she took real leadership in the community. Flaherty says she was tireless. Another former colleague at the DA's office, Jim Barnese, calls Judge Rodwin a tremendous individual. She was a team player, always someone who was eager to help and lend a hand if he needed it. Beyond that, he says, Lisa always recognized the human element of what she was doing. If the greater achievement was to stop short of a full prosecution to save the victim further pain, that's what she would do. People always came first. Outside the office, her work on behalf of vulnerable people continued. She was instrumental in establishing the Family Justice Center, a one-stop resource for women facing domestic abuse, which has just opened a new satellite office in Amherst. Judge Rodwin has done important work on behalf of children in foster care immigrants and refugees, diversity in the courts, and fair treatment for women and people of color. She has also shared her insights in innumerable CLEs and other presentations to judges, district attorneys, police officers, and students in the law school's domestic violence clinic. For Judge Rodwin, this is more than a job, it's a calling. The quality of human empathy served her well in her campaign for family court in 2008. There was a lot of retail politics going on, parades, introducing herself to strangers, Flaherty said, but she naturally likes people. She warms up to people and to strangers, and she meets people well. She's also very smart. She would know everybody at a political base event because she would work at it. She has an ability to communicate with people, and this is the important part, in a genuine manner, because she genuinely likes people. For her steadfast concern for the most vulnerable citizens of Erie County, her energetic advocacy for those at risk and troubled families, and for her many contributions to the betterment of our community, we are proud to present the Distinguished Alumni Award to the Honorable Lisa Block Rodman. J. Sergala, Jr., class of 1982. We <laughs>
We honor Michael Sargala, trial attorney in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, for his commitment to public service. In his interview, he speaks about an early job when he worked with Jim Harrington. Uh, my third year, I was really lucky to be able to work uh, for um, Jim Harrington, who was one of the award recipients last year, mm -hmm. um, uh, a great uh, criminal defense lawyer who was representing uh, a, a member of Sinn Féin uh, who had been arrested at the U.S. border. And, and so I, I was able to do some legal research um, in helping him prepare for a trial, uh, which was fascinating. And um, I had no idea then that a few years later I would be working for INS, which was the other side of, <laughs> of the coin. <laughs> If you knew Mike Sergala in the early 80s when he was in law school, you might remember the motorcycle. He got around campus on it, and as his classmate Tanya Harvey recalls, he was a bit of a daredevil. It's also said that he never missed a chance to go downtown to Bocce Pizza or to Anderson's for frozen custard. Never again. Mike is a hardcore vegan now, no pepperoni for him. <laughs> but that gutsy streak has served him well. Mike, whom we honor tonight for his distinguished performance in public service, has gone after some pretty bad actors in the criminal division of the Federal Department of Justice. As part of the Human Rights and Special Prosecution section, he focuses on border security and gross violations of human rights and humanitarian law. He has also faced some danger himself. Yale Law School professor Harold Coe, who worked with Mike on a task force dealing with U.S. policy on the International Criminal Court, recalls their traveling to a big conference on the ICC at a report in Kampala, Uganda. Not long after they got there, a rogue rhinoceros tried to attack and had to be shot to protect the delegates. <laughs> and then two weeks after they left, an Al-Qaeda bombing hit Kampala. It's a wild and dangerous world. People think of DOJ lawyers as prosecutors, not diplomats, Professor Coe says. But Mike is a great team member, calm, extremely diligent, Good-natured. He's a gentleman in every respect. That's a gentleman, not a pushover. At the DOJ, Mike has tackled cases and policy issues involving alien smuggling, document fraud and financial crimes, terrorist funding, narcotics, war crimes, child soldiers, genocide and torture. And he has brought other lawyers up to speed, both in his teaching at Catholic University of America and George Washington University, and in the dozens of presentations he has done for audiences, including the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and various United Nations units. Michael has always been very authentic to himself, not too concerned about what others thought, and could be counted on to do the right thing, says his classmate, Tanya Harvey. You got the sense that he was in law school for the right reasons to do good and to make the world a better place, and not necessarily to make a lot of money. Lawyers work for the public in these kinds of jobs, and Mike has always been committed to serving, says Bretzi Broder, who graduated from Buffalo Law a year ahead of Mike, and now works in consumer protection with the Federal Trade Commission. That service extends to SUNY Buffalo Law School, where the Sergala family has sent a lot of tuition checks over the years. Mike is the middle of three Buffalo Law siblings between his sister Kate and his brother JB. When current students call him to plead for help getting a foot in the door in government work, Mike pays them more than lip service. He's been exceptionally committed to meeting with and mentoring recent graduates of the law school, Betsy Broder says. It's not just coffee. He takes a real interest in individuals. For these people, that can be the difference between giving up hope and feeling there is some meaningful path He's always finding ways to create connections and provide a larger, larger web of support for those coming out of the law school. For that service to the law school, and more broadly to the nation and to the cause of a safe world, it's my honor to present the Distinguished Alumni Award for Commitment to Public Service to Michael J. Sergalicki. Extreme pleasure to do this next award. 
We are presenting the award for business achievement as a lawyer to Bill Savino. When interviewed, Bill reminisced about his most memorable law school moment, one that had absolutely nothing to do with his distinguished legal career. Well, graduation was, was interesting. I still have people mad at me because my mother had um, taken one of my black shirts and embroidered the baseline to Sunshine of Your Love across the back. And as I walked up to meet Soya Menchikoff, one of the two lead authors of the Uniform Commercial Code, I picked up my sport coat, my gray sport coat, and just turned and showed everybody at Klein Hands my baseline on my back. <laughs> and the nice lady that was walking on the stage at that moment, also graduating, later became a judge and always gave me hell about <laughs> basically <laughs> obliterating, her, obliterating her moment in the sun. <laughs> Bill Savino has only two speeds, says his colleague Gary Graver. And I modified this, Gary. One is on and one is turbo. When he's on, he's a handful. When he's turbo, just watch out. We honor Bill today for his performance in business, his long career at Damon Morey, where he is a senior partner and chair of the business litigation and insolvency department. Certainly bears that out. With a special emphasis on business litigation and insolvency, he's one of the best known commercial attorneys in Western New York. As one of his partners at Damon Mori, I can tell you that when Bill first arrived at the firm, the firm didn't have much of a commercial litigation practice. So what did Bill do? He sat down, he wrote a business plan. I know for a fact he's kept the document because he shows it to me on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at it, you can see where we are now and what he has put together. He put that plan into effect, and it worked. He's now formed a commercial litigation group that includes over a dozen lawyers, support staff, and paralegal. The business of law in many ways is a relationship game, and Bill is a natural schmoozer. He's out three or four nights a week meeting people. He truly gets the business side of the practice, how to get clients, how to retain them, how to keep people happy, and how to grow the business. Bill is passionate about what he does. He cares deeply about our law school. He's a past president of the Law Alumni Association and contributes in many ways for the benefit of our students. He's been teaching law class at the management school for as long as I can remember. But his passion in life doesn't stop there. And I'm not talking about Liz and his family. You may know, for example, that he plays a mean bass guitar as we saw at the start of this. He plays in a blues rock band called Jelly Jar. And for anyone who doesn't receive the emails, <laughs> they play routinely at 31 Club. They've been at it for 16 years, and they still fill the bar when they play. The only difference nowadays is they have to start a little bit earlier. <laughs> then there's the tailgating. Bill is the ringleader of a diehard quartet of lawyers who never miss a Bills game at Ralph Wilson Stadium. This has been going on since the early 80s when, says his friend and colleague Bruce Septel, the Bills were so terrible they had to give away the tickets. <laughs> Through thick and thin, no matter how bad the weather is, we go to the game, Zeftel says. We were at the comeback game, the zero degree playoff game, the last game played on Christmas Eve. Bill knows the team like a stat man at ESPN. Every player's name, number, position, where they went to school, when they were drafted. And they do tailgating right. Good food, they have their grill, a little nip here and there to brace them from the cold. As terrible as the Bills have been all these years, Zeftel says, Bill has kept us together. Then there's a the passion that's a little more expensive, the cars. Bill commutes to work in his Porsche Panamera, and he has owned a few Ferraris over the years. He recently bought a Ferrari from an owner in Chicago, he found it on the web, and decided he wanted to drive it fast. He took it down to a racetrack at Watkins Glen, where there's a price and they'll let you drive. He drove fast, and he wrecked the car. <laughs> Fortunately, he had special collision insurance, because the repair bill was about $70,000. He doesn't do that anymore. As we said, two speeds, on and turbo. There is no one quite like Bill Savino, and tonight we are pleased to celebrate and to claim his, uh, him as our own 
For his exemplary performance in business, it's my honor, my distinct honor, to present the Distinguished Alumni Award to William F. Savino. Russell Jr. Tonight we present an award to Buffalo City Court Judge Robert Russell, a non-alumnus who has significantly impacted the community and the nation. In his oral history, he talks about what motivated him to create our country's first veterans treatment court. Well, I, I think first of all, just realizing uh, the service of our veterans uh, to our country, uh, realizing that in the most recent conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, about 2.4 million have served. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all heard the reports of those that are having challenges and readjusting. Mm -hmm. And we started to, and we started to see in 2006 some of our younger veterans from the most recent conflict being arrested, having challenges. Uh, dependent on substances, having mental health disease or disorders, mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress, major anxiety, depression, uh, some traumatic brain injuries, and realizing that veterans were committing suicide, uh, 22 veterans a day, mm -hmm. that unless we as a society begin to address it, mm -hmm. begin to uh, engage and provide the needed services, um, we were doing a disservice for those who served us if we don't do something. For distinguished service by a non-alumnus of the law school, we honor tonight someone who has done more than anyone else in this room to keep Starbucks in business. <laughs> <laughs> City Court Judge Robert Russell, um, you'll rarely find him off the bench without a grande paper cup of house blend. But caffeine equals energy, right? And Judge Russell has poured his energy, his compassion, and his ingenuity into making the city court not just an arbiter of justice, but a real force for good in the lives of those who come before him. A different kind of judge would look at the parade of defendants in trouble for property crimes related to their drug addiction, sigh, and ship them off to jail. In 1995, Judge Russell looked at that parade, went to his boss, Chief Judge Thomas Amadeo, and proposed a radically new way of administering justice. Why not, he said, start a drug court, intervening in the lives of these defendants and helping them get back on track with drug treatment and intensive supervision. They established one of the first drug courts in the nation, and Judge Russell continues to preside over it with a finely tuned sensitivity to the ways people's lives can go off the rails. He has that personality that is what you need in a drug court judge, his boss says. All the different variations of stories that come before him, whatever excuses people bring, he can see through all of it. But his compassion and his willingness to go the extra mile that's necessary to stay with someone until they get it, those things are rare. Patience and understanding are his major assets. In 2002, Judge Russell took the therapeutic court model a step further founding and presiding over Buffalo's Mental Health Treatment Court, which provides targeted interventions for defendants suffering from mental illness. And then, in 2007, he ran into one defendant he couldn't get to. No matter how hard he tried, this man wouldn't open up about what was going on with him. Judge Russell found out that he was a military veteran, so we sent a couple of vets to talk to him, and the floodgates opened. There are some things that only vets can share. That led Judge Russell to establish Buffalo's Veterans Treatment Court, the first in the United States. In this court, veterans who are in trouble with the law make regular court appearances, undergo intensive drug treatment, and are tested for drug and alcohol use. Right there at the courthouse, a team of federal, state, and local veterans organizations link veterans with the programs, benefits, and services they have earned. The Veterans Court has become his signature success. It even got him invited to Washington, D.C., where the National Drug Control Policy Bureau gave him an Advocate for Action Award. 
not to mention a private tour of the White House. Now the rest of the country, really the rest of the world, is realizing how effective therapeutic courts can be. Judge Russell helps train court personnel from the nation who come to Buffalo for a week to learn how it works. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bonnie. <laughs> and has mentored visiting jurists from Israel, Germany, Canada, Bermuda, Argentina, and elsewhere. His colleague, Judge Ejnet Ogden, says it succinctly, calling him a very good judge, a very good lawyer, and a very good person. We can't hold it against them that he went to law school someplace else. <laughs> For outstanding service to the community and the profession by a non-alumnus, non we are proud to honor Judge Robert T. Russell, Jr. I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. I'd especially like to thank our honorees and their friends and family, many of whom traveled great distances to be here. Please drive safe. Thank you, folks. See you next year.